I'm the uh, Secretary of Institutional Relations and International Cooperation, Cooperation at the uh, <laughs> School of Humanities, is a long title, <laughs> School of Humanities and Educational Sciences of, at the National University of La Plata. And I would like to welcome you all again to this, this conference we are holding as part of this new joint project between the USA and Argentina. Share dialogues on gender, ethnicity, geopolitics, history, and memory. This project is one of the beneficiaries of the US Embassy in Argentina's grant program for cooperation and exchange projects. The University of La Plata is extremely grateful to the embassy for choosing and sponsoring this series of conferences. And I would like to thank particularly to the Assistant Cultural Officer, Mr. Michael McLean, and also again to Nori Serda and Giselle Dubinsky for all their support and hard work during the preparation process. At these events, 22 professors from the USA and Argentina will discuss and call into question the connections, intersections, and points of contact between concept, concepts such as ethnicity, class, feminism, testimonial literature, translation, decolonial turn, and language teaching, geopolitics, history, and memory. This cycle of conference is called Feminism, Testimonial Text, Dystopias, and, Trans and Translation in Argentina and the United States. At today's sessions, we will hear from Dr. Emek Ergun, and now Alicia Parnoy will introduce her. Good afternoon. Uh, Emek Ergun is Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Studies and Global Studies at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte in the United States. She is the co-editor of Feminist Translation Studies, Rutledge, 2017, and the fifth edition of Feminist Theory Reader from the same publishing house in 2020. Emek is also a feminist translator and her most recent translations include the Turkish translation of Octavia Butler's classic speculative novel, Kindred, published by Itaki Press in 2019. And the English co-translation of a book titled The Purple Color of Kurdish Politics by Pluto Press, forthcoming in 2022. It makes a uh, first single authored book, Virgin Crossing Borders, Feminist Resistance and Solidarity in Translation, will be published by the University of Illinois Press in 2023. And her talk today draws on that research study. Her talk is titled Exploring Feminist Solidarity at the Intersections of Transnational Feminism, Feminist Translation and Affect Theory. Welcome, Emek. Thank you, Alisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. And thank you to all those who worked hard to make this event a possibility, especially Maria Laura Sporturno and Anna Principi and the sponsors. It's a pleasure to be here in the presence of such distinguished scholars and share with you my work exploring the political power of feminist translation. I hope my paper will build nicely um, on yesterday's brilliant presentations by Alicia and Maria Laura. I would like to begin my talk with my personal journey, which explains my interest in practicing and researching feminist translation as a mode of, oh, sorry, I forgot my, all right. Um, so my personal journey, which explains my interest in practicing and researching feminist translation as a mode of cross-border connectivity. I was raised in Turkey by two revolutionary parents and an inspiring older sister and a well-known feminist activist in Turkey whose rebellious stance of justice for all introduced me to intersectional feminism early on and enabled me to see firsthand how one could and should fight for justice simultaneously against multiple fronts of oppression. My family equipped me with epistemic hunger, 
political curiosity, ethical sensitivity, and subversive energy that have over the years been sustained by numerous other people, most of whom I've never met but benefited immensely from through their books. In fact, I was very young when I started learning about the power of books, particularly books that exposed injustices and ingrained in me the wisdom of resistance. After all, I grew up with banned books. Books I came to understand were consequential. Words mattered. They carried dreams of a just world that could be mine, that could be ours. Books moved us as they moved among us. So wherever I went, I carried a book with me. My passion of traveling with books, both literally and figuratively, began with that early faithful bond. Growing up in Turkey in a working class, leftist, and profoundly secular family as an Alevi, which is a marginalized religious cultural community in Turkey, navigating and surviving simultaneously functioning systems of oppression was a skill I had to learn early on. And reading books was a central component of that coping process. Books were where I took refuge when the oppressive and fear-ridden realities of gender class, religion, and political affiliation were too much to bear on my own. As I traveled to the worlds of stories hidden in books, I learned that books had their own stories as well. And those stories could be just as powerful. For instance, the stories my parents told me numerous times about their heartbreaking book burning incidents in the repressive aftermath of the 1980 military coup showed me that reading books could be a form of resistance to hegemonic power structures, as well as a threat to fascist regimes. At the time, like many people in Turkey, my parents had to burn almost all their politically suspect books so that in case their house was raided by the military police, they would not be imprisoned for working for an underground revolutionary party. In fact, my father named me, born one year before the coup, Emek, which literally means labor in Turkish, in honor of that party, which was called Labor's Party. Over time, all those stories solidified my belief in the power of words and power of books. It was no wonder that when, my when I heard my parents tell me those painful stories of destroying their books in the face of possible government retaliation, it felt as if they were, they were mourning after fallen comrades. It was then that I found out that one could indeed mourn after books lost books that leave long lasting traces on oneself and let them see the world from different places and lead them to different paths of life. And years later, when I helped my sister hide her politically suspect books, the thrill I felt was because I now knew that saving books was really, really important. We had to make sure those books lived on so that their theories of liberation, stories of resistance, and dreams of justice continued inspiring. So we hid them well. I had not yet learned that books also lived on in translation, as Walter Benjamin famously said. Through such encounters with books and stories about books, I discovered early on that some books were so powerful that their words could spill out of pages and pour onto the streets and start protests of change. When I eventually encountered feminist books, my conviction about the political power of books solidified even more. And some of those books I could read only because their translators had labored hard to rewrite them in my native language. Thanks to that cross-border act of retelling called translation, I could engage with stories rooted in different lands and landscapes and expand the boundaries of myself beyond the familiar limits of my immediate world. Thanks to translation, I could develop an early appreciation for the distant, the unknown, the foreign, the other. My passion of translating feminist books and researching the subversive potential of translation is rooted in this personal history marked both epistemically and affectively by those memories. 
After I received my bachelor's degree in translation studies in Turkey, where I learned to conceive translation as a political and ethical question of intersubjectivity and cross-border interconnectivity, I came to the U.S. to get my master's degree in women's studies, which congealed my already primed interest in feminist politics. It was in this time and space of displacement um, that my fascination with feminist translation emerged, an interest that was kindled by the very act of my traveling into the U.S., where, much to my dismay, I was feeling disconnected from the feminist movement in Turkey. Once again, it was translation that saved me and enabled me to stay connected to the feminist movement in Turkey because I started translating for the renowned uh, monthly feminist periodical called Pazartesi. It was also in this time period that I met a feminist historian named Hannah Blank and her book draft at the time that was titled Virgin the Untouched History. At the time, I was working on my master's thesis on the medical construction of virginity in Turkey, and I was struggling with finding a comprehensive source that de-biologized virginity and substantiated that with historical data. There was no such book in English or in Turkish. My thesis aimed to condemn medical virginity tests in Turkey and reveal that virginity was a fabricated idea, that it could not be tested even by the medical doctors trained to believe so. Then one day in 2004, I saw a flyer on campus that announced an upcoming talk on the history of virginity by Hannah Blank. I was at the front row. After I met Blank following her thought-provoking talk, I realized that I had finally found that feminist source that would not only help me demedicalize virginity in my thesis, but also alleviate my geopolitical anxieties about writing a thesis on Turkey's virginity politics for an Anglo-American audience. Virgin appeared at that very moment when I needed a credible source that would help me conceptualize virginity as a cross-cultural patriarchal problem. Blank shared with me an unpublished version of the book, which dismantled long-lasting virginity myths, especially those fabricated by the Western medicine. And it did it so compellingly that I knew I had to translate it as soon as it was published in English. I did not want this book to continue missing from Turkey's feminist repertoires. In the meantime, Blank became a member of my committee and her rigorous um, archival research shaped my own research and my thesis, which would eventually become an introduction to the Turkish translation of her book and travel back to Turkey. By the time Virgin was finally published in the US in 2007, I had already started my doctoral studies. And I had a lot of questions. Could Virgin's translation become a bridge? And here comes that same metaphor that Maria Laura was talking about yesterday. Could Virgin's translation become a bridge between feminists in Turkey and those in the US? Would feminists in Turkey walk across that bridge despite the well-archived oppositional gulf of the West versus the East that the traveling book attempted to cross? In the rest of my talk, I'll explore these questions that conceive translation as a cross-border encounter between subjectivities that are not only situated differently in different cultural landscapes, but also positioned unequally in global economy. So I want to focus on this encounter between selves and others to reveal translation's potential to connect subjects and subjectivities across borders, borders that are usually promoted to polarize and segregate in the colonial patriarchal global order. Translation, by facilitating cross-border flows and encounters of differently assembled and situated stories, helps reveal our semiotic gaps, interpretive habits, epistemic illusions, and subjective imperfections. It's due to this power to defamiliarize our truths or half-truths and expand our horizons by welcoming different others that translation can transform us and our relations with others and the world. This is the very celebratory aspect of translation. 
Celebrating translation is about reimagining our relationships to the world of differences. And it is only through an ethics of hospitality, vulnerability, plurality, and solidarity, as Alicia was talking about it yesterday, which is an ethics of feminist translation that we can learn to become with each other rather than against each other and coexist in our differences. Translation in this sense is the very principle, practice, and promise of transnational feminisms. And when reconceived as such, translation means hope, hope for a future in polyphony. In my talk, I'll discuss this, the, the transatlantic journey of Virgin to interrogate this hope in feminist translation, which I argue is simultaneously a global possibility and a global fantasy. So the first part of my talk will talk about it as a possibility, and the second part will focus on it as a global fantasy. I see feminist translation as a transgressive form of activism, where the translator uses language to intervene in systems of inequality. So the feminist translator works to disrupt systematic exercises of gender oppression and its intersections with other systems of domination through her meaning-making practices. Translating Hannah Blank's Virgin the Untouched History into Turkish was such an activist project for me. I strategically translated this book uh, into Turkish because I believed in its potential to unsettle Turkey's patriarchal virginity codes, as well as help build some political affinities between women across this geopolitical chasm that is built between the West and the East again. Virgin presents a feminist historical account of the various configurations of virginity in the West. And I know this is a complicated and problematic term, West versus the East. We can have a chat about it later. But in the context of the book, Western history includes histories of ancient Greece, early Christianity, late medieval Europe, the Renaissance, and it comes all the way to the 21st century US. Most of the time periods and events narrated in the book pertain to historical legacies that are exclusively labeled as Western, and Turkey does not appear within the boundaries of that label. In Turkey, virginity, in cooperation with patriarchal honor codes, constitutes a systematic form of violence against women, manifested particularly in state-sanctioned medical virginity tests and honor-based violence against women, particularly femicide. Virginity is extremely medicalized in Turkey, which makes the notion really difficult to challenge. Yet, the book refutes the scientific fabrication of virginity as a measurable fact and exposes the history of medicine's flawed equation of virginity with the hymen. The book actually argues that the hymen was invented. Um, the book's critical take on the hymen makes it really relevant and defiant for the Turkish context. And in Turkey, the highly active and well-organized feminist movement always publicly challenged virg virginity violence. But these challenges often fell short of questioning virginity itself. So while feminists struggled to end the medical virginity tests, they did not argue that well virginity could not actually be tested. Before the, so they basically just argued that it's wrong rather than saying it cannot be done. Before the translation of Virgin, there was no book in Turkish that exposed this medical fraud. And to this day, Virgin remains the only critical text on virginity in Turkey. And the fact that the book is currently in a seventh printing and has a steady sales record attests to its ongoing epistemic and political relevance. Turkish Virgin was published a year after the English book. And given its geopolitical scope, I was simply concerned that the exclusively Western focus of the book could cause some disjunctures for Turkish speaking readers and undermine the subversive goals of the project. To help prevent such disjunctures, I added that long introduction that I mentioned earlier to the book, which was based again on my master's thesis. In this preface, I discussed Turkey's own virginity history using Hannah Blank's larger theoretical framework. The preface aimed to provide readers in Turkey with an analytical model on how to adapt virgin's feminist critiques to their own locality. 
In doing so, it showed that the contents of the Western book um, were in fact highly relevant for them, despite the fact that this, these contents were geopolitically framed in a category that rejected Turkey. The preface, along with my non-sexist vocabulary choices, were all guided by my feminist agenda, which I fully disclosed in, in, in the preface. So this preface also became kind of famous in Turkey because it was the first publication that openly called itself feminist translation. So it keeps being uh, referred to for that reason as well. The one translation strategy that really became my signature in the text was my translation of the term hymen as himen, rather than as kızlıksarı, which is the most common Turkish word used for hymen and literally translates as the membrane of girlhood, reflecting Turkey's patriarchal sexual economy that attributes the hymen, um, the gatekeeper of women's access to adulthood. So you're a girl, if you have the hymen, you're a woman only after you're magically touched by the penis, basically. While I made all my translation decisions in line with the next second, I'm gonna... Okay. While I made all my translation decisions in line with my feminist agenda, in order to understand whether these strategies actually made a political impact or not, I had to investigate the text reception. This is why in 2010, I conducted a research study in Istanbul with 22 feminist readers of the book who kept very long and detailed reading diaries and then participated in focus group discussions with each other and then did interviews with me. So how did the readers in Turkey relate to a book that was written for and about Western women? Did they manage to build bridges between the virginity stories of the West and their own locally grounded virginity narratives? And what do their reading experiences tell us about the possibility of transnational feminist solidarities? The readers of Turkish Virgin developed two main reading strategies to connect with the book. Sorry. Okay. First, they engage in a comparative and complementary strategy by reading their own virginity realities into the text to compensate for its limited geographic focus and build a bridge between Turkey and the West. One of the participants, Defne, articulated this strategy in the first focus group saying, and I'm going, I included all these long quotations from my participants so you can follow easily. So she said, we keep saying that the book doesn't talk about the East, but I already know the East. I recognize it from my own life. And I saw that such oppression is still going on in the West, although they have overcome some of their chains. Another example came from Yasemin, who said in, um, in the focus group again, the book directly brings you to self-reflection. I mean, I don't want to perceive this book as ultimately, yes, it is telling the history of the West. And it is already very precious just doing that. It doesn't need to include everything. In this respect, it's also very precious because it brings us to ask questions within. That's to question ourselves. Finally, in another group session, Denise responded to the debate on whether the Western scope of the book was an Orientalist reflex on the part of the author or whether it was just an unavoidable result of the limitations of her archival research. And I should add a note here that I never use the term Orientalist or Orient Orientalism, any of these in my study. So it only came from the participants. So she said, I actually read this book as one perception of virginity created in another culture, in another geography, under different conditions, through other religious, sociological, etc. lenses. I mean, I read it as a cultural transfer, and I wanted to do that. I mean, compare various virginity notions. I think seeing that difference was just as negating for virginity as anything else. These comments, these comments point out at the most common strategy that the readers used to make the book's distant um, narratives meaningful, relevant, and useful in the context of Turkey. 
the readers deployed the book's debiologizing gesture as a tool of cross-border connection to relate to the Western virginity narratives, and eventually, as Denis put it, negated virginity both at home and abroad. So with its disruptive approach to virginity, the book provided its readers with a common critical ground where the virginity stories told by the book and those added by the readers had the opportunity to meet, engage, and enable cross-cultural comparison and negation of patriarchal virginity norms. Indeed, the main debiologizing claim of the book, virginity does not exist, was embraced by all the participants. This was not an act of passive compliance with the authoritative voice of a Western text, but rather it was a product of active negotiation with it, which was described by most of the participants with the word convincing. The word choice is meaningful because virginity does not exist is not an easy statement to accept, given the strong hold of the medically framed virginity ideology in Turkey. In fact, virginity was so forcefully medicalized in Turkey that an outright denial of its existence comes at first glance as kind of ridiculous. The reader constituted in Turkey could thus reject this statement, which seems to erase both her own subjective testimony to the troubling existence of virginity and the high social and scientific recognition granted to it. So to agree with this claim, the reader needed to be actively recruited, that's the word convinced, into an epistemic stance that was against their local habitual disposition. This is why, this is exactly what the readers, this convincing is exactly what they experienced. So I just included two quotations here because it illustrates this process of owning an alien quote-unquote truth claim. So Dylan said, even the author's virginity doesn't exist claim itself changed my view on virginity. Indeed, I too used to think that virginity was just about the presence or absence of the hymen. I mean, I knew about the types of the hymen, etc. But other than that, the way she refuted these medical facts through her claim that virginity doesn't exist, my mind significantly changed on that matter. And given that Dylan was at the time a medical student, this actually makes a huge difference, right? She, she eventually became a doctor herself. Then Pemba also wrote, in the beginning of the book, it seemed like a too assertive statement, but after I finished the book, I now think that no other idea should be advocated. It seems that the newly designed cover of the Turkish translation also helped the readers connect with the book more easily because the image similarly highlighted the book's critical stance on virginity as it reminded them of blood that supposedly follows quote unquote virginity loss. But interestingly, the same image of bloody image also reminded the readers of honor-based violence against women. And in that way, just like the book itself, the cover also became a geopolitically hybrid critique of virginity. In Aisha Gil's words, she said, I first saw the book at my sister's. Initially, its title drew my attention. As I reached for the book, I noticed the blood on it. My hand somewhat hesitated for a few seconds. It was as if that blood would smear on my hand, but only a few seconds later, I held the book in my hands and it aroused great curiosity in me. In that way, it is a very brave cover. It really is our untouched history. This comment implies that the tabooness of virginity is so strong in Turkey that it can even generate a bodily reflex to not touch the book. This is why the cover image was designated by all the participants as brave and touching the book was seen as an act of embodied defiance. In fact, in the context of Turkey, the taboo defying face of the book was so prominent that several participants mentioned refraining from reading it around people, covering up the book and feeling irritated or frustrated because of the reactions they received. For instance, a kin who was visiting her parents while reading the book wrote in her diary, 
Last night, I realized that the book I'm holding in my hands is titled The Untouched History of Virginity. But what if my father sees it? Forget about reading it in sight. Even if I stay in my room and read it there, my mom will bring food to my room and see the cover and then ask me numerous questions mixed with fear. Although she knows that I'm not a virgin, I had to tell her because of an illness. It was a big crisis for her. That's why yesterday I decided to cover the book. For a while, I couldn't find anything to cover it with, and now the book is in my hands, covered with a paper bag. If my dad realizes that the book is covered, he'll just say, ah, she must be reading the Communist Manifesto or so. Also, Mujgan, who read the book mostly on the bus, um, on her way to work and back home, said... The cover was drawing people's, especially men's attention. You know, a cover like that draws a lot of attention. I mean, it has a very striking visual. So I was like, I can't deal with you right now. I'm very busy. And I put the book inside the diary. I was like, back off. I'm reading here the story of ages. Go away. I can't argue with you right now about the cover. You know what? I'm reading the history of what you have done to me. Impressive quotations. And clearly, even the seemingly evasive act of concealing the book and guarding against confrontation was actually an act of covert resistance in the face of a hostile social setting that did not welcome any oppositional consciousness on virginity, which, however, continued to develop precisely because of that act of hiding and evasion. This is how the feminist remake of the book's cover helped the readers claim the book as their own history. So the book actually became theirs. The antagonistic positioning of the Western text in regard to the reception context makes the, because it's Western, makes the comparative reading strategies of these readers all the more fascinating. Because instead of giving in to the usual homogenizing gesture of comparison, which usually results in the establishment of one party's superiority and the other's inferiority, these readers' attitude manifests the attitude of wanting to learn from the other's differences. An interesting example of this was seen in Pembe's diary, which begins, uh, which begins with, the, with the, um, this quotation. And she wrote this before she started reading the book. So this is her expectations from the book. I'm curious about how virginity is experienced in the West, or more accurately, what kinds of experiences women are made to go through there because of virginity. Until now, the stories of women being stoned to death, the backwardness of countries practicing female circumcision have been told in capital letters. I think now I will finally read about the sins of the West. So this is a sarcastic comment, right? And, and the comment sarcastically emphasizes the scarcity of critical knowledges on the West's own quote unquote barbaric gender conventions, as opposed to the abundance of colonial discourses on such violent gender practices taking place in non-Western societies. So we think gender violence belongs to non-West. But her comparison is still not aimed at repeating the conceded cultural superiority complex of colonial Western feminists. So unlike Orientalist discourses, Pembe's comparative reading strategy does not reproduce the hierarchical gesture of the West versus the East dichotomy that puts Western feminisms and women on a pedestal. Instead, she welcomes to learn the opportunity to learn about virginity oppression in the West so that she can imagine a relational, a more complete global picture of virginity violence. In their comparative reading, several readers also highlighted differences among virginity norms and practices across cultures. But again, they did not draw their conclusions within the superior West discourse. Bilge so articulated this clearly in an interview. She said, I don't think that things are smooth sailing in the West either. On the contrary, there is a very powerful, refined and latent patriarchal perception over there, no matter how much the blatant maltreatment of women has decreased in everyday life in many Western countries. And these are very important. I mean, I'm not going to make a hierarchy of sufferings and massacres. 
So the readers of Turkish Virgin did not deny the epistemological and political potential of the traveling book by assuming that the supposed gap between the East and the West was unbridgeable. Instead of casting the book as an irrelevant product of an alien culture or the assimilative voice of the imperialist West, they simply experienced it as a facilitator of cross-cultural growth and critical self-reflections. This attitude is key for building transnational feminisms, because as Charlotte Bunch says in quote, we cannot depend on our perceptions alone as the basis for political analysis and action, much less for coalition. Feminists must stretch beyond, challenging the limits of our own personal experiences by learning from the diversity of women's lives, end of quote. Moreover, the differences, cultural, political differences were interpreted by these readers, neither as indicating a lack of cross-border interconnectivity, like we are too different, nor as politically hindering transnational solidarities. Differences were taken for what they were, different understandings, different experiences, different contexts that simply attested to the non-existence or invalidity of patriarchal universals like virginity. In short, the othering gesture promoted by Orientalism and colonialism was not replicated in these readers' encounters with the book since they practiced cross-border reading as a connectionist act. In this process, the assumed gap between the East and the West was collaboratively bridged by the author, translator, publisher, cover designer, and readers. This geopolitical bridging against the divisive force of Orientalism was further consolidated by the second reading strategy that I call differential universalization. This is a two-tier textual move, which may initially appear as, paradoxical, um, as a paradoxical approach to cross-cultural reading or as a confused state of interpretation. Because on the one hand, the strategy enabled the readers to imagine a universal ground of virginity, oppression, and resistance across histories and geographies. On the other hand, the universalizing gesture is combined with a clear recognition of differences among women and their gender realities. So it is, in fact, a move to recognize plurality and particularity within universality. So how did readers make such claims? For instance, Cezanne described the virginity simply as a universal discourse deployed by, deployed by patriarchal structures to socially and physically oppress women. And then Leilak said, in the group, we talked about how all these were so familiar and universal. We all agreed about that. When we think of the West, we assume that virginity is unimportant there, but a taboo here. But as we talked in the group, how common it all is in reality. As it turns out, virginity is as important there as it is here. Similarly, Kremza wrote in her diary, the book helped me feel a sense of affinity. For example, it taught me that the oppression that women experience due to virginity is not unique to Turkey. The control of women's bodies is a universal adoption. These quotations illustrating the universalizing strategy are in fact only a few among so many others. The readers could reach this conclusion of universality because the book interrupted their perception of virginity as an issue that only affected people in Turkey or in outside the West. It seems that by encouraging the readers to dismantle their preformed assumptions about the so-called liberated Western women and discard their Orientalist assumptions about that virginity was a problem um, in and of the so-called backward East, the book simply removed the discursive barriers set between women from different geographies, and in doing so, it brought them closer under a newly discovered political universality. The designation of um, virginity as a universal patriarchal problem was repeatedly emphasized by all the participants, regardless of their acute awareness of the political danger of such universalizing discourses that often perpetuate Western ideas and truths as the only legitimate ones. 
But upon a closer look, it becomes clear that the readers did not exactly repeat the universalizing gesture of the hegemonic West, because their claims of universality were not claims of global sameness. Rather, they emphasize that the commonalities in virginity regimes were always accompanied by different experiential and social, particularly religious realities. For instance, Yasemin said in the interview, this book changed my perspective on virginity in the West because I saw that such horrible things did in fact happen in those relatively quote unquote modern Western societies as well. And I can say that this has changed the way I view patriarchy. I mean, wherever you go, I'm sure it will all be different depending on the culture, but eventually it's not less than here. It's just not less. Milena also wrote in her diary, it seems like in all societies, the initial foundational ideas about virginity emerged and got shaped in different ways, similar ways. Although there are many differences when compared, the similarities between cultural perceptions of virginity are striking. This simultaneous recognition of universality and plurality was even expressed in the reader's syntax in the spoken setting of the group discussions and interviews, for instance, the utterances of universality claims were almost always incomplete sentences. The first example here actually um, shows that at the end. Because the participants always cut these sentences in the middle to insert claims of cultural differences. The haste with which they intervened in their own universality claims shows their understanding of universality as geohistorically flexible and open-ended. The, the differential universalization strategy then is not a move to ignore or erase differences, but rather to cross the divides built around those differences. It's a move to expand the scope of feminist knowledges, to learn from each other's liberation experiences, and to envision feminist solidarities and change. It is this potential to enable people to hear each other across languages, convey their different political experiences across borders, and enrich existing social justice praxis that makes feminist translation indispensable for transnational feminism. This is why doing translation and reading translation is a key part of transnational activisms, because forget about practicing it, we cannot even imagine solidarity unless we believe in the possibility of cross-border connectivity. And feminist translation helps us experience that connectivity in the intimate setting of reading. So based on these findings of my reception study, I argue that when configured and practiced as ethical acts of cross-border rewriting and reading, Feminist translation can be a catalyst for imagined and eventually actual transnational feminist communities like the, you know, the sol communities of solidarity, as Alicia was talking about um, in, in her speech yesterday. So feminist translation can be a catalyst for these imagined communities by facilitating dialogues between constituencies that are geopolitically deterred from hearing one another through the alienating and adversarial mappings of the globe. Feminist translation then is a communal activist project precisely because it recruits isolated readers into imagined transnational collectivities identified by the subversive agenda and vision of the translation project. This is why almost all the readers in my study emphasize that virgins should be translated into other languages so that their imagined feminist collectivity simply expands beyond more borders. And they added that those translations should also be done by feminist identified translators so that the agenda, the textual structure, and the language of the book do not pursue any patriarchal motives. The fact that the readers made numerous comments about how the feminist stance of the translator made it much easier for them to connect with the book attests to the power of feminist translation where the translator openly discloses their political and ethical agenda rather than pretending to be quote unquote neutral transmitter or simply nobody.
Among my translation strateg strategies, the preface seems to have made the biggest impact in enabling the readers to embrace the book. In fact, several readers noted that the visibility of the feminist translator in the text enabled the cooperative reading experience. So this is the last quote of part one, where Yasemin said, I perceived the reading process as if Hannah Blank, Emma Gergen, and me as the reader were having a conversation. Neither one was excluded, nor someone was secretly whispering something to my ear. No hidden agendas, right? Witnessing two differently situated feminists cross-border collaboration in a book seems to have inspired the readers to imagine a larger community of feminists tied together by the fact that they were all touched by virginity violence and directly implicated in the book. All right, thank you. I'll stop here and um, I'll just take some comments and questions if you have any. And I wanted to end with this. Um, so this is a picture from um, a feminist protest in Turkey. So this, the banner that she's holding says that we are the grandchildren of the witches you couldn't burn. So I, it's, it's very interesting to me that these slogans also cross borders in translation. And I tried to trace the slogan. And if I am correct, I think it originated in South America. So from there, it went into English. And from English, it came to Turkish. It's just interesting how these feminist, um, you know, slogans also reach to us through translation. But thank you. So questions, should I stop sharing or? Um, as you wish. You can, you can keep. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, I'll just do that to stop, makes it easier to see the chat. Okay. I hope um, I didn't read too fast or anything. <laughs> I, I like what while questions arrive. Um, I, I I like the the simple image you gave, but so powerful of the translator, the solitary translator being invited to transnational communities, and that's a stereotype of the translator. I, I I am not a translator, but it's a stereotype what the people um, have about becoming a translator. You know, a solitary work or working on your own all the time. And for me, the imaginary I have is always a contact with other people, you know, yeah. translating with someone else. And this idea of making communities from the act of translating was really impressive. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, we also imagine reading as a solitary act too. usually, right? You have a book and you are in your room and you're, but it's actually a very crowded action. If you think yes. about it, it's not just you and the author. There are others in, in that book. And I mean, I wish I could talk more about my participants you know, they really, really produced a ton of responses. Like they, the way they read this book, you could tell it was a very crowded experience and how much they really added into this book. Because it actually is the, all the details in the book, ancient Greens, they, Greece, for example, they really cannot find much in that narrative to relate to, but they did. They, it's amazing how they connected their own local personal stories with, um, for example, a Vestal Virgin who had special powers in ancient Greece. And one of the readers said it changed her life. Like, I mean, I'm not like, uh, you know, I'm not exaggerating like the, the, how the readers actually found ways to bring these differences together so they could talk to each other. It's uh, so it is a very crowded experience. And yeah. Meg, I, I really loved your presentation, the first part. Mm -hmm. And what I like a lot is this um, uh, outreaching to the readers mm -hmm. and the process was, was that after, and it was after your translation was done. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, and it's a conscience raising act. I mean, it's a political act. Um, of having these meetings, these groups of people yeah. getting together and and processing uh, the read the reading. Do 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 women there have this kind of collectives in which oh, yeah. they get together to read? Um, and mm -hmm. is, is that a practice that is developed in, in all this 
the levels of the society mm -hmm. or is that only intellectual groups that do this? No, it's very common in, in, in um, kind of the feminist movement, right? And I worked with a particular feminist collective. So I first sent an email, an invitation. I said, hey, this book just came out. Would anyone would be interested in this study? I got so many responses. And this was a very demanding research. Like they really lived with this book for a whole month. It, 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 it took time and energy. And originally over 40 women wanted to participate. Then some, and I said, yes, whatever. And then, but it, it kind of developed, it went to 22 eventually. But um, so this particular feminist collective, they were already doing a lot of meetings to talk about certain feminist issues or questions or to discuss particular books. So this is this is quite common. Um, and Turkey's feminist movement is so active, like, and they have to be active, right? I mean, they're in Turkey. So it's, um, but it's, I really kind of, um, th there already was such a vibrant energy and dedication there that I, I got lucky. It's um, so the, this this didn't feel bizarre, but it a lot of the participants said that it gave them the opportunity to really focus on the text that they don't always focus on a book this much, and they particularly loved the diary part. They said it 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 made them kind of think more about their own personal experiences and whatnot. And, and there were very different, it was a very diverse group of feminists. Um, some had just started, you know, maybe with a small feminist club activity on campus. And some of them were very well, you know, kind of well-grounded members of the movement. So the diversity itself was also interesting to see and how the book impacted people with different levels of feminist exposure, let's say, yeah. There is a comment on the chat, and I don't know if you want to look at it. Sure, it's, you mean Fernando's, right? It's, it's not Fernando, she's, he's oh, copying, oh, he's yeah, copying yeah, a comment from, from yeah. the YouTube. Carola, I'm guessing it's hi. I just wanted to remark that I'm fascinated by the fact that the translation of this book created a connection between between the different experiences in relation to virginity from the West to the East. You're right. Yeah, it is, it is actually fascinating. It's um, and again, the this is another thing. Virgin in its, you know, I read the original manuscript, right? Virgin actually was twice the size, and it wasn't just about the Western history. So the publisher actually made the book into a Western text, and they made Hannah Blank take out all these other things that they did not deem. So Turkey actually was in the book originally. There was some things, a couple of things about it. So they made Hannah Blank take all that out, so the book would be shorter, so it would sell more, I guess. Um, but it was just, um, it's yeah. It so in 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 the publication process, the book kind of became more quote unquote alien, if you will. Um, but also, we have to acknowledge the fact that Turkey receives a lot of translation from English, right? Which is a fact of kind of global knowledge production, the direction which is going to be the focus of the second part. Um, so the readers have. The readers have more experience with connecting with texts that are coming from the West, basically, right? Um, so, yeah. And, uh, and like any any writings that have been generated by this translation, maybe reviews, but also maybe studies there in in Turkey. Yeah. This translation got so much attention, unusual kind of attention, because translations also don't get much attention in media, right? So um, I don't know how many interviews I gave um, as the translator and sometimes with Hannah Blank. Um, so, you know, and, and the thing is, I was lucky that I could work with Hannah Blank, so we, um, who was very supportive of the project, and we had a deal. Um, if somebody wanted to interview Hannah Blank, I was going to be there with her. So we, we had to do it together. Um, so there were a lot of published interviews in newspapers, magazines, and then a lot of reviews. And interestingly, the book came out in 2008. I mean, how much time has passed? And um, 
I talk about this in my book. Um, about a year ago, this um, Turkish TV series came up and the first episode, there was a virginity drama and the Twitter simply exploded because people got really mad. Um, and, um, you know, and the next day, people started responding to that kind of TV drama and they were actually immediately referring the book. And then somebody again wrote another review of the book. You know, we usually write reviews of books shortly after they are published and then we let them go, right? Yeah, now they're acknowledged, they're there. But this book um, constantly gets that kind of wave of attention because unfortunately the issue is too relevant. Um, and yeah, and in, in the second kind of when I went back to Turkey um, in 2000, um, you know, 18, and I talked to the same participants, and I said, do you think the book is still relevant? They all said, I wish it wasn't, but it is more relevant now, because Turkey is becoming more and more conservative, right? And so, yeah. But yeah, there was a lot of media, media attention. And make a wonderful uh, presentation. The first part, the experience and uh, the translation, the reading. I was wondering, uh, perhaps you mentioned this, but how many editions did the translation uh, in Turkey get? Just one edition or, or how many have been published? Oh, you mean, um, so the, the printing, reprints? Yeah. My yeah, print. it's it's in seventh print. We didn't change anything. I didn't I didn't add anything. It's just the book basically keeps getting printed. I also have to say, you know, um, oh. yeah, seven. It is in seventh right now. Oh, how many copies have been sold? You know? Oh uh, well, I I'm not sure. I was yeah. gonna say that the the after I think the fifth printing. Yeah. Maybe a thousand each. It's really not that many um, in Turkey. I mean. So it's a very good sign that it's constantly being reprinted. In Turkey, that means the attention is always there, right? But publishers do not, unless you become a bestseller, publishers never go beyond a thousand. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's that's normal. But I also, another thing I just remembered, Alicia, another kind of attention that the book is still getting is because it, it named itself as feminist translation. So when I had my bachelor's degree, feminist translation was not a thing in my school. I had never heard of it. And now it's, it's this kind of explosive subject. It's always what people love it. And there's a lot of attention, a lot of interest in undergraduates um, and among graduate students in Turkey too. So the, the, Translation has been excessively studied at this point. It's almost like we are sick of it. I was like, go study some other translations, you know. And it's not that it was the first feminist translation. It wasn't, but it just used the terminology. So it kind of becomes that. But there's also a lot of scholarly publication on that front. And there are some others on the... All right, so um, Ana Sofia says, beautiful presentation, and Noah says, I would like to know a, a bit about the preface. Did you approach the project knowing you would write it, or was it an idea that came to you during the process of translating the book? This is a great question. Actually, the idea came from the publisher, believe it or not. So when I wrote my master's thesis, I mean, I was lucky. I had really done, like, my master's thesis was 100 pages, so I, I already had all the history down. Um, and when I was talking with the publisher, and they were very supportive, and I had a feminist editor, by the way, so I, you know, um, and um, one of them said, oh, you know, if I, I was trying to simply show them that, look, I have the background to do a good job with this translator. So I mentioned the thesis, and they said, oh, why don't we add it to the book? Um, so and then we had to get Hannah Blank's permission, and she immediately said yes. So, um, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't know at the time I was writing the thesis that it was going to make it to the book. But, um, and and it was a good learning experience for me because after that, I just it's now my <clears throat> number one negotiation item in with publishers. If I'm going to do a translation, I say I will write a preface, and is that okay? Um, yeah. And then Noah has another. No, oh, yeah, no. 
And Belen has a question. Um, while listening, I started to think about Turkish feminist authors, specifically if they're currently being translated into English. Um, no, that's completely fine, Belen, and good question. Well, I mean, Turkish authors are being translated more and more into English, um, but which ones? right, the ones that kind of get Nobel Prize or do, uh, I mean, there's a lot of critique about this question of who gets to be acknowledged and translated into English. Um, so again, in the second part of my talk, I'll talk, I'll, I'll discuss this, but um, unfortunately, the American publishing world particularly loves to bring um, stories of third world women, particularly from Muslim dominated countries, if their narratives fit into this kind of orientalist agenda, right? Oh, here comes another sad story of a memoir from another sad Muslim woman and hopefully saved by some Western country and she's happy now. That kind of, with the similar cover and everything. It's just, um, so not always, but again, I mean, I think we need to have more conversations about who gets to be translated and who doesn't. Um, so you need some kind of acclaimed award or yeah, maybe to make your way into English. But also maybe, you know, why, all, uh, why are we always trying for English, right? I know it, it means a bigger market, but uh, Maria Laura, you know, we talk about this, that we need actually more translation between languages that are not necessarily hegemonic, right? It's, um, yeah. Did I address all the questions? I think I did. Should I um, continue into the second part or? Okay, the second part is much shorter. So let me share the screen. All right. All right. So in the first part of the talk, I argue that feminist translation has immense potential to offer us contact zones within which empowering cross-cultural encounters may take place if supplied with the necessary conditions of possibility. My reception study revealed that the Turkish version did function as such a contact zone and that its feminist readers connected with the book in solidarity. So that was the possibility of the transnational hope, that hope in feminist translation that I mentioned earlier. And now I will discuss that very same hope as a global fantasy. As much as my study with Turkish speaking readers provided us with a hopeful portrayal of feminist translation and transnational feminism, I would like to complicate and perhaps even de-romanticize that picture with some cautionary tales to highlight the failures or risks of transnational feminism. While I believe that translation is key, to transnational feminist solidarities, I question whether the communicative and connective potential of feminist translation is fully put into practice, no matter what the geopolitical directionality of translational travel is. How is the, where is the flow happening, right, between where? Following this question, in this part of my talk, I'll argue that the promising picture of Virgin's Turkish translation as a celebratory project of transnational feminism could emerge partly because of the specific geographic direction and trajectory of its flow. What if the textual travel being analyzed here were vice versa, from the east to the west? Could we then speak of a similarly hopeful case for, feminist trans, uh, for transnational feminism? Would a similar book on the history of quote-unquote Eastern virginities, for instance, with a, with a focus on Islam and its take on virginity in different geographic contexts typically deemed quote-unquote Oriental, would such a book stand a chance if it migrated to the West? Would it be allowed to speak to the Western audience in an egalitarian dialogue, or would it be an endorsement of the rescue paradigm that too often defines Western perceptions of non-Western gender realities? With what, with what political motivations would that book be released to the Western markets? 
How would it be packaged and promoted? Would it simply replicate the trope of the exotic veiled Muslim woman and present itself as a titillating case of unveiling the mysterious life of the Oriental woman, put everything in quotation marks, perhaps with a picture of a veiled woman on its cover like this, the example here. Would this book be translated to unsettle the West op oppressive virginity codes? Or would it simply be used to advocate a supposedly post-feminist tale of the liberated Western woman positioned once again, again against the chronically oppressed Eastern woman? Would the knowledge acquired by Western readers as a result of this translational encounter serve to forge a bond between Western and non-Western women? Or would it emphasize Western readers' sense of superiority? More importantly, would the book's knowledge claims be elevated to the status of universal truths, as in the case of Turkish virgin, or would it remain as something exclusively of the East? In fact, would the book on the Eastern history of virginity even be allowed to travel to the West with a title that claimed virgin universality, the untouched history of virginity? Or is it only Western books that can be marked and marketed as history? These questions might seem speculative. They're actually not. On the contrary, they are predicated on the vast literatures of third world feminisms, transnational feminisms, and postcolonial feminisms, where the operations of the Western hegemony in the global production, validation, and circulation of knowledge are well recognized. Yet, these questions need to be urgently addressed if we want to build truly egalitarian feminist connections around the world and across all directions. We well know that the world we live in is deeply divided, yet the borders that separate us also connect us, and that these borders can and should be crossed if we want to remake the world a place of justice and peace and plurality. But in order to achieve that, we must find ethically and politically responsible ways to travel and connect ac across borders in translation. Turkish virgins translation and reception have showed us what a promising project such transgressive traveling could be. So I wanna briefly talk about the second study that I that I did. So in 2018, almost a decade after the original reception study, I conducted another round of interviews with 17 of the 22 original participants. And I simply wanted to see if the book still had some impact among them. In that study, I also asked the readers the same hypothetical question that I just asked you, what if? If Virgin's transatlantic travel happened the other way around, I asked, would you expect silence, solidarity, or appropriation from Western feminists? Interestingly, despite their commonly acknowledged dreams of transnational sisterhood, which by the way is not a dirty word in the context of Turkey's feminist movement, so sisterhood does not have the same imperialist connotations that it has in the US or in English, um, and it also doesn't sound gender essentialist. Um, so anyone can be your sister regardless of their gender, basically, right? But um, so despite their common dreams of sisterhood, the readers mostly articulated charity rather than solidarity as the probable interpretive scheme of Western feminists in their hypothetical encounters with that traveling oriental text. These geopolitical concerns of mutual ethical responsibility in cross-border feminist encounters raise important questions about trust as an essential effect of transnational feminism. And they highlight that that trust needs to be earned and that we need to work way more, way much harder to earn that trust. So out of the 17 readers, only three of them actually imagined that that hypothetical oriental virgin would receive unbiased reciprocity from Western feminists. One of them, Aisha Gil, illustrated that perspective saying, I think a book produced here would have very similar stories in it, although there is a lot of orientalist curiosity about what goes on in Turkey. Again, I never use the term orientalist. So this is coming from them. 
But because I see feminism more in terms of sisterhood, I believe a feminist who lives in the US would read the book with a feminist agenda, not an orientalist agenda. The trust that those three particular readers placed in the anti-colonial Western reception of the imaginary Eastern text was extended only to feminist readers, as they believe that non-feminist readers would still resort to orientalist meaning-making mechanisms and most of the readers um, discussed Orientalism as the dominant paradigm of Western reception. Um, so, you know, but again, those three said that, well, feminists would not do that, the rest would. On the other hand, the responses of the other 14 readers oscillated, constantly oscillated between trust and doubt. These accounts provide crucial geopolitical lessons on the affective making of transnational feminist solidarities, lessons particularly for Western feminists. That's why I would like to read Selma's, this is a, this is a long quotation, but it's beautiful. So I'd like to read her words of wisdom at length. I think it just ex expresses that um, lesson well. She said, I would want such a book to be translated to English very much, but I don't think books written in Turkish get to be translated into English that much. I also wonder if such a book's travel would generate any Orientalist reactions. I mean, would it further turn us into a victim? But their book was like that too. They didn't become victims in my eyes, but we could become victims in their eyes. After all, this is a matter of violence, and violence is experienced everywhere. I mean, women actually don't differ much from each other on that front. That's why I believe it should be translated. But there is definitely a hegemonic relationship here. So an Orientalist perspective would certainly emerge like, oh my, look what kinds of horrible things happen there. They would act as if that violence was far from them, like such things never happened to them. They would perceive the book as if they never went through that history themselves. But then again, if they could get past that, the book could help establish commonalities. Regardless, I would want that book to be translated because such knowledge circulation is crucial. I want to believe in the idea of sisterhood. This comment designates the current global hierarchy of knowledge production and circulation rooted in the colonial agenda of constructing the West as the place of epistemic, political, moral, and cultural superiority. And it basically says that this issue, this global hierarchy of knowledge production and circulation is one of the central issues of transnational feminism. We need to address this. In fact, the simultaneous appearance of the doubtful, would that book even go there? And the hopeful, regardless, it should still be translated. The simultaneous presence of these two kind of affective modes um, points at the problem of a global hierarchy of knowledge, which elevates Western texts to the status of the truth, while positing Eastern ones as irrelevant non-knowledge, or relevant case studies at best that only serve to uphold the Western truth. This hegemonic relationship was noted by other readers as well. Um, Edge, for instance, said, if the book traveled to the West, I think instead of explaining a theory like Turkish Virgin did, it would turn into a case study. Like, let's see what happens in Egypt about this issue. How do women in Iran deal with it? I remember Sabah Mahmoud's work that explains to the West how Middle Eastern women perform agency and how they're not passive objects. This is in fact obvious, but we must illustrate, explain, and theorize it so that people in the West understand it as it is. I think this virginity book would have to do that as well. Also, would that book go to the US? It would first have to prove its significance to the West. Edge's comment, similarly unsure whether an Eastern virgin would make it to the West, calls attention to the disparities in the global traffic of feminist texts, which is already a common critique in transnational feminism literature. 
This is a call to the Western feminists to question their protocols of translation and reception and engage in more ethical practices of world traveling, to use Maria Lagones' terms. So it's not enough to translate more feminist texts into hegemonic languages. We also must create an ethical reception ethos to make sure those same traveling texts do not end up reproducing assimilative interpretive schemes. Selma's comment about also illustrates another common element in the reader's responses, the expectation of pity politics, that is rescue mentality, savior complex, missionary, whichever name you pick. So they actually expected pity from Western feminists in their encounters with non-Western discourses on gender violence. When such a discourse originates in the East, oh, sorry, um, but what did I do? Oh, when such a discourse originates in the East, violence against women becomes oriental violence against oriental women. So it all becomes about the Orient. In fact, the readers frequently use the phrase, and this was amazing how they all use this, looking down on, um, it's a translation, to describe that epistemic violence that they expected from Western feminists. So I have two quotations here that illustrate this. And Bilgesu said, we read virgin in reference to anatomy, but I think they would read it more in reference to the East. You know that pitiful condition of ours that they look down on, the claim that our society is the one where women are most subordinated, most exposed to sexism. I don't think they would read the book only in reference to virginity. They would read it as another layer of our pitiful condition. Here we read women in the Western context, but they, they wouldn't read women. They wouldn't read the book in reference to women's common problems. They would read the oppressed woman of the Eastern culture. So they would, they would read the East. And then Shema also said, I feel like if they read that book in Europe and the US, they would read it with a perspective like this, like, oh, poor things, how much they suffer. They couldn't stay away from that Orientalist perspective. When we read texts about the West, we try to critique it in equal terms. But when they look at us from that geography, there's always a looking down on. They would say, look, they haven't overcome this problem and they can't anyway. Although I must admit, what I am doing right now is also a little like looking down on them. So I'm not sure. They might surprise us. We would have to try and see. Again, I quoted these at length because the geopolitical doubt they express about Western feminist colonial habit of looking down on the other woman is not only warranted by a long persistent history of Orientalist knowledge production and global activism, but also imbued, this, these are imbued with this hopeful invitation to change the current global economy of feminist translation and reception. So these critiques are not intended to reclaim the oppositional roles of Orientalism and close off the chance of alliance building across colonial borders. Rather, they are to remind us of the possibility and necessity of transnational feminist solidarities. They are just telling us what we need to do, right, to achieve that solidarity. So they're not just a testament to the presence of arrogant perception, again in Maria Lagones' terms, but also an appeal to loving perception. Because in Shema's words, they might surprise us, right? That, that, that element of surprise is important. Indeed, there is another way to connect with another one that's not grounded in the missionary logic of colonialism, but we need to work hard for it. So again, I will let Aisha say that. If that book were translated to English, it would be a text that went there from the Orient, and she used the English term here, and the stories would be more like the sins of the evil men of the East, while in reality, the conceptualization of masculinity is quite a universal thing. I mean, our men are bad. Okay, I accept that, but theirs are bad too. But because that would be a book produced here and translated to them, and because there's unfortunately a hierarchical relationship between the East and the West, I don't think the text would be embraced there in the same way. 
Western feminists should question their feminisms because we need that kind of solidarity. We must mutually sustain each other. There's no situation where you can come and rescue me. If I rescue myself, you will rise from there. There's no other way. Aisha beautifully, eloquently explains that our lives, feminisms, and our stories are already so violently intertwined that to make the world a just place, we need to find nonviolent ways to connect with one another so that my self-defined journey to liberation simply enables your self-defined journey to liberation and vice versa until the boundaries that separate my and your blur into bigger and heterogeneous grounds of multiple flexible hours. In short, the geopolitical doubts raised by my participants indicate that the bridges they built while reading Turkish Virgin are not as sturdy or secure as they seemed earlier. In fact, the readers argued those bridges can stand strong only if they are mutually sustained by feminists situated on the other side. That is, translational bridges bring us together as tentative yet promising collective becomings in solidarity only if Western feminists maintain and walk it with the same care, curiosity, commitment, and compassion required to engage with others. These bridges bond feminists across borders only in and through ethical practices of translation and reception, which first and foremost require Western feminists to see feminism as a transnationally polyversal platform that does not belong to a particular geography. And they need to learn to see women from outside the West as feminist agents whose locally grown politics are not only legitimate, but also globally relevant and necessary and something that they can learn from. Of course, all these questions that I raised, the, the critiques they imply, the promises and hopes that they harbor are missing an important element. The political role and ethical agency of the feminist translator who is willing to navigate through the differences and divisions among women to create non-othering contact zones and who strategically rewrites texts so that they can become those transnational bridges. Although it would be naive to claim that feminist translators hold all the decision-making power in the translation process, we don't. Their politically and ethically guided negotiations and mediations still do substantial amount of subversive work. And it is my contention that if their transformative labor is further recognized and celebrated, and if their visibility as activists is increased, their political impact will correspondingly grow. This task belongs to all of us. We all need to acknowledge and support the work of feminist translators because it is thanks to those feminist translators that feminist texts and discourses, slogans, actions travel across borders and enter the discursive fields of different political localities. Um, and in order to appreciate and encourage their vital work we have to engage in more conversations about translation ethics and politics, as well as politics of reading and reception. Beyond all that, we first, and I, I can't believe we are still here, but we need to change our understanding of translation as secondhand copy with no epistemic value. And we have to be willing to produce, read and experience translation as an enriching encounter with the other. In other words, in, in addition to seeing translation as a transformative act of self-reflection, we also need to reconfigure it as a necessary operation of transnational solidarity building. In order to achieve such stretching across borders, we need to unlearn our deep-seated ethnocentric reading habits that too often assimilate the intellectual voices and works of third world feminists in quotation mark. Only by eliminating our assimilative translation and reading habits that we can learn lessons of resistance and liberation from the experiences of people living in other parts of the world and facilitate global solidarities. 
So let's give a bigger chance to translation because translation can bring us closer to one another and to our dreams of a better future. Black feminist warrior Audre Lorde once said, in quote, as outsiders, we need each other for support and connection and all the other necessities of living on the borders. But in order to come together, we must recognize each other, end of quote. Translation can help us do exactly that, recognize each other. Thank you. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. I mean, you can clearly see what an amazing group of people I worked with in this research study that yes. I, I learned so much from them. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. It's very inspiring. Really, very, very inspiring, your presentation. And uh, at the risk of sounding uh, ignorant, I don't know anything about effect theory. And uh, you work, obviously, with it. And I can sort of sense what you're doing. Yeah. But can you, for those of us who have not been in touch with effect theory, uh, tell us a bit mm -hmm. about it? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question, actually, Alicia. So originally, um, I was going to talk about two different projects and affect was going to be the part, the, the focus of the second part. And then I decided to focus on one project. So affect actually never became the focus of the talk. So you're completely right about it. Um, and this particular project, um, I definitely kind of draw on affect theory a little bit, but again, it's not one of the defining theoretical frameworks that I use in this work. But, um, and, and, and I only recently started thinking more about connections between ethics and politics of translation and affect theory. So affect theory basically, I mean, in a very simplistic terms, kind of analyzes the politics of emotions, right? And, um, you know, how, um, and it explores affective economies, how emotions are constantly manipulated, for example, by structures of power to push us into certain positions. And how, um, you know, like Sarah Ahmed, one of the most important names in affect theory, how she wrote a book about the, the promise of happiness, how patriarchy, heterosexism, neoliberal capitalism, they constantly promise us happiness. If you do this, you're going to be happy. If you get married, you're going to be happy. And how, you know, we buy into these, right? But this is actually control mechanism in some ways. Um, so there's that. But also, I am, I think, more interested in the role of affect in enabling solidarities. What, you know, trust, for example, keeps coming up that we live in a world that really feeds us um, mistrust. We don't, we are afraid of each other. We don't trust each other. And, you know, I mean, communities have lots of reasons also, right? I mean, we come from histories of violence and oppression. So the question is, how do we nourish and grow trust in environments that make it really difficult to do so, for example. Um, so I, that's why I think I find my participants' statements really empowering, because I can tell they actually don't trust this problematically homogenized category called Western feminists, right? I recognize the problem with that generalized kind of language, but there's, there's clear mistrust there. Um, and so first, we need to talk about why they don't trust quote unquote, Western feminists. But then again, um, I love that they still say the book should be translated, right? Even if it serves Orientalism, there was not a single person in my study that did not say it should. It, and, and, and I find that fascinating that despite the mistrust, they say there's element of surprise there and there's element of hope there. So again, how do we kind of fight against this mistrust while growing these emotions. And so the question is, we need to politicize emotions more and see them more as part of our knowledges, which 
you know, one of the basic claims of affect theory is that, you know, reason um, and, you know, rationality that that belongs to the area of knowledge, which is men's area, right? And women belong to, you know, emotions belong to women. So it has nothing to do with knowledge. I mean, this is a very false kind of separation. So we need to, it's, it's an act to reclaim emotions, actually, as political um, and epistemologically valuable and all that. Great, thank you. You have a bunch of questions yes. in the chat, so. All right. Okay. So, uh, which one is first? Is it Mercedes? I yes. So Mercedes says, I find it interesting how women from the West tend to feel superior to women from the East, as in one of the quotations said, taking them as a subject of study. Yeah, it, it is really, really fascinating. I mean, um, so I am also a professor who, who constantly teaches women's studies in the US and my area is transnational feminisms. And I have, I think, dedicated my teaching career to fight against this superiority complex. And unbelievable, every semester, over and over again, students come with this perception of, oh, we're gonna learn about poor, pathetic brown women and how we are gonna save them. Um, how persistent this is. It's very disturbing, you know, and, and as they are exposed to different narratives, um, they start really getting upset with themselves that they bought into this, right? But it's, again, this kind of mentality is very well um, kind of imposed on them by, by structures of power. I mean, particularly, I mean, the, the U.S. feeds on it. So, um, so, yeah, you know, how to break this. And the other side of this is, women in other parts of the world then may may actually believe in that oh they are superior and we are inferior so this be, the rift simply becomes bigger right rather than seeing each other as different but equal kind of um we just buy into this and that solidarity cannot grow in that kind of environment um yeah, I hope I responded to the question, but I've never questioned this attitude and I think it's time to start doing, yeah, that, that's wonderful, Mercedes, right? It's there, and there's so much to question here. Um, and, um, and then Andrea says, are there feminist Turkish writers writing in English under what might be called diasporic literature? Yes, who touch upon these topics from the lenses of East epistemology and it. Um, Andrea, yeah, good question. I mean, um, there, there are probably in terms of novels, I think Elif Shafak is, um, so the last name, she spells it as S-H-A-F-A-K, I think. Um, she's a novelist and she actually, I think, started writing in Turkish and then she switched to English and she lives in diaspora in the US and she now her novels are she first writes in English and then they're translated into Turkish, which is kind of interesting. Um, so there are some um, and this is not unique to Turkey, by the way, a lot of women who are from Middle Eastern countries, let's say um, a lot of writers um, from different Middle Eastern countries, instead of writing, for example, in Arabic, they write in English sometimes. Um, and, and a lot of this is like particular genres, memoirs. But again, they're trying to serve a very particular market need, right? Give me that singular voice of the, the Muslim woman. And there are like three tropes. You're either, you know, um, victim, um, or you are the kind of the terrorist that's, you know, and then what was the third? This, this is not me. I'm quoting another scholar who actually found three tropes. But again, what I'm saying is this, this literature that is that should be extremely diverse and heterogeneous because, I mean, what is Middle East, right? It's not one thing anyway. But somehow in the course of travel, like translational travel, it becomes one. That's how Middle East becomes one, actually in the mind of the West, that it is the, the reason why people imagine the Middle East with singular notions, that itself is a translational um, kind of doing, actually. Um, and Andrea, if so, are they translated back into Turkish crossing borders or building bridges transnationally on sisterhood? 
Um, Andrea, that's also a good question. It, I think I would be more equipped to think of this in terms of academia. So, you know, there are a lot of academics um, living and working and teaching in the US, Canada, Europe, and they do write their texts, including me in English, right? And then some of their books get translated into Turkish and go back to Turkey. Um, so there are examples of that. Um, so, yeah, there are, it, it, it does happen, but I, that's, I haven't really studied, you know, kind of scholars from Turkey writing in English and, but that's a good question. And thank you, Victoria, for listening. Let me stop sharing here and uh, yeah. So any translations of blank into Spanish or Portuguese? Any attempts? Any yeah. okay. you know what is interesting though? So when when Virgin was published, there really was not that many books on, on, on the topic at the time. After Hannah Blank published, because um well, the U.S. is obsessed about abstinence-only policies, which is, you know, is very conservative kind of economy of sexuality that simply is trying to convince the youth into not having any heterosexual sex. Um, but because abstinence has such a strong hold um, and is federally funded in many cases, um, the you see a sudden growth in virginity literature. Um, so uh, scholars actually worked with different age groups of, you know, kids and college students did interviews. Um, so her book was, I don't want to say the first, but maybe the first kind of comprehensive critical take, but it wasn't the last. M many other textbooks kind of um, followed it. And it's not even being printed in English anymore. That's another thing. The book is still being reprinted in Turkish, but not in English. It's only being sold in electronic copies now. Um, so, and as far as I know, it was only translated into Japanese, I think. And I don't know if that, pro I, I remember Hannah telling me that it was being translated into Japanese, but I never heard when it was completed and this and that, or if it was. Yeah. And sometimes um, people ask me, you know, is, is your book going to be translated into Turkish, right? That is, and, and I say, or they say, are you going to translate it? And I said, no way. It's I'm not translating my own book. It's um, I would actually love someone else to do it. But also the, 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 the I mean, you realize that even this presentation actually has a very particular kind of audience in mind, which again, that large category of Western feminists, because it's trying to, you know, open people's eyes to something. I'm not saying it's not relevant for anyone, but um, the book particularly has that audience in mind thinking, you know, um, well, how to achieve transnational feminisms, right? This theory that was born in the US in some ways, this transnational feminist theory, at least it's called as such, and uh, but when we talk about transnational feminism, we keep going back to the same problem. Well, you're, you you claim the theory, but you're not doing the work, right? That kind of. Um, so I'm just hoping that the book will actually work as some kind of invitation. But what happens if it gets translated into Turkish? It needs to actually get another mission there, right? What it is? What is it? What is it trying to achieve in Turkey? I don't know. Uh, there's another question there. Mm -hmm. So Sabrina says, how interesting. Thank you. You have just said your students do have this priority attitude when studying feminists outside the USA, but would you say all Western? No. Yeah. Again, this is the problem with using generalizing language, right? Of course. I mean, here is the interesting thing. If you look at the, the theorist I cite, 
um, you know, a lot of the theories that I actually cite are within that category called Western feminists, you know, uh, feminists. I always joke about it saying when I wrote my, this project started as my doctoral research. And I say, if you look at my doctoral thesis committee, it was five white native born American women. They were Western feminists, right? But I could do, do this kind of work precisely because they did not buy into that hegemonic Western feminism. And they brought in very different perspectives and really opened my eyes to different parts of the question. Um, so again, I am talking actually about a very particular group of kind of um, a group of arrogant feminists, let's say. Again, whatever language I use, it will be problematic. But And sometimes they end up in the audience. You know, that's also interesting. I've had some very interesting kind of encounters in conferences where I presented this and people got mad. Um, so it's, yeah, yeah. Is there another question? Um, Belen is asking, what do you think of rewriting patriarchal text through the lens of feminist translation? Yeah, probably the most controversial question, right, in feminist translation. Um, and um, here is the thing. I, you know, translation, I, translation to me is, is a kind of writing, right? I mean, I do not see original text as purely original. Everybody, like... Original texts are also rewritten in their ways. I'm not saying there is a sense of originality in it, of course, right? But all the words you use, ideas, you know, our language is made up of multiple others. So translation is kind of the opposite of that to me, right? You basically, your main focus is on someone else's words, but there's still lots of originality in it. And unfortunately, we tend to ignore translation in, in origin and origin in translation, kind of if I'm making sense. it's um, So I started with that because what I'm trying to say is that go ahead and rewrite a patriarchal text from a feminist viewpoint and see where it goes. And if somebody gets curious about it, let them read. Um, so my only, I think, um, principle in this matter is I tell my reader where I'm standing in regard to the text. Oh, would I do that? Would I actually spend a year of my life and, you know, to translate a patriarchal text? Right now, I want to say no, but who knows if I find a patriarchal text that I was like, hmm, maybe I should rewrite this and maybe that will be a brilliant text. I don't know. Maybe I could do that, but I'm not against any of that, you know, because they're all writing experiments um, and you can still do that, ethically do that. I think it's, um, I don't, I don't know if the patriarchal author would like that, but I honestly don't care. So. <laughs> And um, Augustina says, thank you for your presentation. I agree about translation being used as a tool to bring us together and also to cross the sociological borders, which can be bigger than the geographical ones. I completely agree. I think the borders in our heads are um, really, really difficult to cross sometimes. Um, so it's, yeah. Until we live in a borderless world, I guess we just need to constantly learn to cross them and recross them. And thank you so much for the for the great questions. It's no, thank you, Emek, for this wonderful presentation. <laughs> Really wonderful. I think there are no no questions. Uh, yeah. So I think we can go to the break mm -hmm. till the the next session at six mm -hmm. o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Sure. But thank you again. Thank brilliant. you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. See you <laughs> thank you. Brilliant. So see you in fifteen mm -hmm. minutes.